October 1917, the storming of the Winter Palace in Petrograd, the Russian capital. Perhaps the most enduring image most of us have of the climax of the Russian Revolution. But these scenes are from Eisenstein's feature film, October, made ten years later. A film that has played a major part in shaping the image of the revolution. But historical image can differ widely from historical fact. Even the phrase Russian Revolution is a misnomer. There were, in fact, two revolutions in 1917, one in February, the other in October. And our impressions of what happened are colored both by the available historical source material and our political prejudices. Newsreel film was still relatively new in 1917. So for the first time in political history, film becomes an important historical source. But even the news film isn't always what it seems. The camera sometimes lies, and many documentary makers in both East and West have re-edited the film record to compile their own sometimes sharply contrasting images of 1917. Before the First World War, newsreel film was used largely for recording state occasions. This was the Tsar Nicholas, Emperor of all Russia, a man who believed himself appointed by God to rule with absolute power a country covering one-sixth of the Earth's surface. The Tsar's family, seen here in rare home movies, owned estates the size of several European countries. His repressive regime was firmly rooted in the past, incapable of coming to terms with the 20th century. Russian documentary makers have understandably edited the film of this opulent, blinkered world to throw the life of the peasants into sharp contrast. Over three quarters of the Russian population were peasants. Less than one in three could read and write. Most lived in medieval squalor with an average life expectancy of less than 40 years. There are still Russian emigres with their own childhood memories of peasant life before the revolution. Their life was very, very uh, dull and miserable because the villages were sometimes a hundred miles apart and they had to really depend entirely on their own company because we saw a lot of the peasants and of course they were very content really because the revolution had started from the intelligentsia, from the middle classes. Uh, the peasant, the Tsar, was still the little father. Uh, whatever else was wrong, it wasn't the little father. They hated the Tsarina, the empress, but he was their little father. And so they were very contented until the revolution really came because they knew no difference. Most of them were illiterate. But um, you saw a great deal of the peasants because they were always in towns and doing work. And they, on the whole, they seemed to be as happy as possible. My family was very much a uh, liberal. And we did uh, go uh, to uh, our holidays. We stayed in a, uh, just a peasant's houses. So we were playing with the peasant's children and we were very much near to them. They were quite a, a nice uh, atmosphere and they were not starving at all. Like all our peasants, they were rich because they had, they built summer houses which they let to uh, people from towns. And one of them, the head man, had 26 of these chalet houses. And they weren't small. Some of them had four rooms or six rooms. So they were very prosperous, our peasants. Well, you see, my grandfather went to Russia in 1868. And by 1900, he was a millionaire, multi-millionaire, because it was the biggest business in the world. I mean, we were the courtos of Russia. And 10,000 workmen pre-1914 war, which were lodged, had every social security possible, had their, you know, everything, health and everything. And that's why we were so popular, you see. In fact, the majority of industrial workers lived and worked in harsh Dickensian conditions. This is Eisenstein's dramatization of women queuing for bread. The condition of the urban poor before the First World War had led to innumerable strikes and helped to cause an abortive revolution in 1905. I lived in Chita, Siberia, where I was born. 
I was born there because my father was a political exile. He was a Menshevik. He was exiled after the 1905 abortive revolution, was exiled to Siberia, met my mother there, who was a medical student. He was a Menshevik, as opposite to the Bolsheviks. But I must point out that in those days, there was only one party, really. They split up when the revolution really started. There were two main socialist parties in Russia before the First World War. The socialist revolutionaries enjoyed mass support among the peasants. The other party were the Social Democrats, who in 1903 split into two factions with different strategies for revolution. Nina Nathan's father was a member of one faction, the Mensheviks. Freedom was always in our family. That was a word that was used all the time. He wanted the reform of government, reform of people having people should have more education and this is what they were all fighting for the right of the individual and the right to express yourself with that this is really what i was brought up in the other faction of the social democrats were the bolsheviks led by the exile lenin they hoped the outbreak of the first world war would be a springboard for international revolution lenin called for the war between nations to become a war between classes but the immediate effect of the war in russia as in britain was to inspire patriotic fervor and national unity. There was a great uh, uh, enthusiasm and patriotic uh, uh, movement everywhere. I remember we were in a spa in the nor north of Caucasus, and I know how uh, it was a great movement of enthusiasm. British newsreel companies seized eagerly on what little film of their Russian allies managed to reach the West. They wanted exotic looking footage and gave it patriotic, optimistic titles, sometimes in sharp contrast with the pictures themselves. Gaumont gave this film the title, The Troops of the Tsar, hardened to all weathers, are preparing a great offensive. Much later, French filmmakers used exactly the same footage to show how awful conditions had been and greatly exaggerated the number of deserters to try to prove their point. Christmas 1916, two million dead, four million wounded, one million deserters heading for home. In Lenin's phrase, they were voting with their feet. Frost and snow covered Russia in January 1917. World War I has been going on for three years. It was a bloody battle of imperialists for a new division of the world, for colonies. They tried to divert the attention of the people from revolutionary struggle. The soldiers froze in the trenches. Every day thousands of lives were lost in the war. At the same time, the officers and rich nobles spent their time in drunken entertainment. New taxes took away everything from the working class. Despair and poverty entered each house. Devastation and desolation. The winter of 17 in Petrograd is an exceptionally hard one. And hard by Russian standards means hard. The city was desperately short of bread. The Tsar's government had done little or nothing to safeguard supplies for the home front. Then, in March 1917, when coal shortage shut down many of the city's factories, the workers streamed out and demonstrated for more bread and, indeed, more of everything. In St. Petersburg, now renamed Petrograd, there were 400,000 industrial workers. Disgusted with war, weakened by hunger and defeat, they had only one weapon, to go on strike. All that winter, there were demonstrations and protest marches through the streets of the capital. Down with Tsar hunger! Down with war! 
On the 23rd of February 1917, the textile workers went on strike and marched through the streets. On the 24th, the metal workers joined in the strike. On the 25th, the strike was general. On the 26th, part of the Petrograd garrison joined the strikers. But it was the Cossacks, the shield of autocracy, who transformed demonstrations into real revolution. The unimaginable happened. This time there were no bodies in the snow. The rifles did not fire. The drawn sabers only waved a comradely greeting. In March 1917, or February by the old calendar, the strikes and demonstrations finally turned into revolution. It took film cameramen a couple of days to realize the importance of what was happening and get out onto the streets. But the atmosphere they recorded on film is confirmed by the childhood memories of eyewitnesses in Petrograd and Moscow. It's clear to me, as though I've seen a film of it uh, last week. We were looking out the window, so a couple of servants and I, out of my nursery window. I was six, by the way. And we saw mounted gendarmes ride into the manège. Um, I can't say how many there were exactly, but certainly something between 50 and 100. And sentries were posted round manège of ordinary soldiers in tall clerical hats. And for the moment, the square was empty. And then suddenly an enormous crowd, led by a student, brandishing a short sword with a red r ribbon round it, filled the square. They then talked to the soldiers and gradually persuaded all the sentries to join them. Then there was an exciting moment. Nobody knew whether the gendarmes would charge the crowd, which of course it wouldn't have been the first time. And then the gates opened and led by the head one on a white horse, also with his sword and also with the red ribbon round it. Whereupon one of the servants said, where did he get the red ribbon for? I suppose he kept it in his pocket just in case he had to surrender. So that was, um, it was pure pageant. Soviet school children are still brought up on the myth that, to quote an official Soviet history, Tsarism collapsed under the shattering blows of the people inspired by the Bolshevik party. In fact, the February Revolution took most Bolsheviks by surprise. Lenin, still in exile in Switzerland, had predicted a few weeks earlier that the revolution would probably not happen in his lifetime. His first reaction on hearing the news of the February Revolution was that it was an Anglo-French plot to keep Russia in the war. The Tsar, like Lenin, was taken by surprise by the revolution. He was forced to abdicate and to retire with his family to one of his country estates. The immediate reaction of the British press to the overthrow of King George V's cousin was surprisingly favorable. Lloyd George sent a telegram expressing Britain's satisfaction that this great ally Russia now stands with the nations who base their institutions upon responsible government. The Western image of the February Revolution continued to be positive. Self-appointed apostles preached the gospel of universal brotherhood on street corners. It was great fun to be able to shout oneself hoarse without being sent to jail. The defiant lines of the Marseillais made wan cheeks flush with new excitement. Russia had her first revolutionary government. Russia spoke out everything she had kept to herself for centuries. The country seethed from end to end like one continuous rowdy meeting. Election fever gripped the Russian people. Soviets or councils were voted in all over the country. Even travelers on the Trans-Siberian Railway would sometimes elect a Soviet for their carriage for the duration of their journey. The school had a quite a reflection of this movement in the whole of Russia. We decided we'll have our own parliament, the, uh, t uh, the school uh, boys and girls. We uh, were also, we asked the uh, teachers to have representatives in uh, their council, and we were given that right. And we had a 
uh, uh, our own uh, uh, newspaper. And in that case, uh, in this way, we have been uh, reflecting the whole atmosphere of the expectation of reforms, but not of a revolution. There's no actual film of the abdication of the Tsar. Instead, newsreel companies showed this symbolic shot of the Tsarist banner and double-headed eagle being taken down. Symbolism of this kind was common in the days of the silent cinema. Even many of the middle and upper classes were pleased to see the Tsar go. They hoped for a modernizing, democratic regime in his place. You see, everybody was always grumbling about the Tsar because the government was, well, there were a lot of scandals with Rasputin and so on. So my family was very liberal. And as a child, I remember people <laughs> drinking champagne and all in our own place, of which I'm very ashamed now, but that's how it was, because they thought there was something much better to come, you see. They were, everybody was very pleased because they never thought of the consequences at that time. Everyone, uh, including the servants, were very excited and felt some kind of new era was about to happen, and uh, our circle, anyway, were very happy about it. We all marched around with red flags. We sang the international. Uh, there were innumerable parties and congratulations that freedom has come and now the world is going to be changed. We sang revolutionary songs without quite understanding what they meant, and I still remember them. Uh, and everything was absolutely marvelous for about six months. <laughs> In Petrograd, the revolution paused to bury its dead. There were not many, but public homage was given to the few who had fallen in the first excitable weeks, and they were buried with honor on the field of Mars. There was no perceptible change whatever. Of course, like most children of that period, I had a French governess, and I had my meals separately from the adults. So my breakfast continued as before to consist of uh, bread and butter and caviar. And uh, caviar was still there. Everybody seemed to be um, eating and spitting out uh, sunflower seeds. You saw them all talking to each other, uh, walking about, spitting out husks of uh, sunflower seeds. And the streets were full of these husks. Discipline collapsed, in a sense. Uh, by discipline collapsing, I mean the way in which soldiers behaved. And of course, you saw in, uh, in wartime, you saw a lot of soldiers, obviously, uh, all in uniform uh, in Petrograd. Uh, and suddenly, you saw them behaving in a way in which soldiers didn't usually behave. Um, there, there were um, uh, sort of uh, quarreling and uh, fighting each other and things like that. In Eisenstein's dramatization, Russian soldiers greet German soldiers as comrades during the heady days after the February Revolution. It was a rather dubious propaganda point that Russian soldiers already supported Bolshevik demands for an immediate ceasefire. Later filmmakers have sometimes used this sequence as if it was newsreel. At the front, all military discipline broke down. The news from home seemed to announce the end of war and a brotherhood of man. They shared their excitement with the enemy. In fact, if there was any fraternization, it was soon over. The self-appointed provisional government, which took power after the revolution, wanted to continue the war. Its stand was conditionally supported by the socialist revolutionaries and the Mensheviks. Only the Bolsheviks, at Lenin's insistence, demanded an immediate end to the war. The only National Assembly in existence was the Duma, more of a debating society than a parliament. Now it had to create a provisional government. The first premier, Prince Lvov, was to be thrust aside within a few months by a fiery young lawyer, Alexander Kerensky, who shot through the skies of 1917 like a meteor and then disappeared forever. He was Alexander Kerensky. In the Allied countries, he was greeted as the savior of the wartime alliance. 
high-pressure publicity men made him assume heroic poses and sent his picture all over the world. His intentions were praised and his industry became a byword. But what could he do to stop a volcano interruption? He toured the trenches and made speeches. The soldiers were enthusiastic about him. This shot is being staged by the man just to the right of Kerensky. He's the film director. Now he's telling everyone to keep still, and now he's telling them to cheer. The Tsar had thought of the film camera mainly as a toy for making home movies. Kerensky came much closer to grasping its political significance. His was the first Russian government to set up its own newsreel company, which is why there's, relatively speaking, so much film of Kerensky. He was a magnetic figure, but a man of words rather than deeds. He tried to straddle all political elements, from the left-wing Marxist Bolsheviks, led by Lenin, to what remained of the right. We thought he was not a suitable person for such a tragic moment of the country. He was rather uh, a, a great phrases man, but not of action. As well as understanding the importance of propaganda, Kerensky was a brilliant orator. The British consul in Moscow wrote after hearing one of his speeches, the soldiers were in a frenzy of hysteria, the generals wept. It was more impressive than any other orator I've ever heard. Despite the American accent on the commentary, this is a Russian film made for export. The provisional government was continuing the imperialist war. In order to get out of that horrible war, all the power must pass into the hands of the Soviets. The revolution was continuing to develop. From the first stage, which gave the power to the bourgeoisie, it would inevitably enter the second stage, when the power would be in the hands of the working people, united in Soviets. Soviets are bodies of truly people's rule. But so far, representatives of petty bourgeois parties who were doing everything to indulge the provisional government had entrenched in them. The Soviets united most of the workers and soldiers. But the leadership of the Soviets consisted mainly of Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries who gave the power to the bourgeoisie. Menshevik leaders in the Soviets betrayed the revolution. The Bolsheviks were still very much in the minority, even in the Petrograd Soviet. Their policies were to diverge even more from other revolutionary parties once Lenin returned from exile in Switzerland. At this time there appeared in Russia a revolutionary of great fame, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, known as Lenin. An exile in Switzerland, he received permission from Berlin to pass through Germany. Arm the poor, Lenin harangued the crowd. Let us build up the Soviet Republic. These fellows are great talkers, an elderly general declared, but they are no men of action. However, a secret police agent warned, look out, he is dangerous. Lenin's Bolshevists went onto the offensive, hatching out plans of overthrowing the government. The Germans thought a Bolshevik revolution in Russia would help them win the war. In April, they gave Lenin safe conduct through Germany in a sealed train on his return from exile. That fact was played on by the enemies of the Bolsheviks. There's no newsreel film of Lenin's arrival in Petrograd. The written evidence suggests he received only the same sort of welcome as a number of other returning exiles. But in Eisenstein's film, the actor playing Lenin is welcomed as the Russian messiah. This view of Lenin is often reproduced in Soviet documentaries. Look out, too, for Eisenstein's crowd scenes used as if they were newsreel. The workers of Petrograd, soldiers and sailors came to Finland station to meet their leader. Getting up on the armored car, he spoke the prophetic words, long live the revolution. The provisional government was a government of landlords and capitalists. No support for that government, Lenin insisted. But we know that history itself has proven that Lenin was correct. The provisional government really did show its true face and the masses did side with the Bolsheviks. A man who returned home after 15 years in emigration predicted with accuracy of a prophet what would happen in Russia within the next few months. The provisional government claimed to be a government of reform, but their first priority was the war effort. They hesitated to give land to the peasants in case the peasant conscript soldiers, who made up most of the army, deserted to take their share. They also felt reform should wait until there was a properly elected assembly. So in May and June, the peasants simply began to take the land, and the war itself became steadily more unpopular. 
Campaigning on the simple but effective slogans, peace, bread and land, Lenin refused all cooperation with other parties. His aim was first to gain a Bolshevik majority in the Soviets, and then to use the Soviets as the springboard for a Bolshevik revolution. Despite this caption on Pathé's 1937 film, there is no news film of the peasants seizing the large estates. What claims to be genuine newsreel footage is in fact an obvious dramatization. Chaos gripped the countryside. The peasants no longer had the respect for the policemen's sabers. They beat up their landlords and seized their properties. The Bolshevik agitation was spreading to the rural districts and to the fronts. Whole regiments left their trenches and a soldier found fighting was a rare sight. The evidence is that the peasant land seizures were pretty orderly in most parts of the country and that their landlords were often far away. Peasant conscript soldiers at the front were also eager for change. So that all along the Eastern Front, Ivan Ivanovich sat it out and wondered why. Wondered why when Russia had had a revolution, life for Ivan Ivanovich hadn't changed one bit. Why for him there was still not enough of anything. Kerensky papered the streets with fresh posters. He was determined to continue the war against Germany, if only to raise the prestige of his government in the eyes of the world. If spirited addresses would have served to sustain morale, Kerensky might have succeeded. What was needed, however, was arms, equipment, and above all, effective leadership. <laughs> One after another, fresh regiments left for the front, fresh victims for the sake of profits for the imperialists. The provisional government demonstrated what it was really worth. Russia is on the eve of a national crisis. Economic disaster reigns in the country, but the provisional government persists in continuing its course of war till a victorious end. Mass desertion of soldiers from the front was a strong sign of anger at the policy of the government. The, ca the carriages were full. Well, you can imagine hundreds of thousands of soldiers. The Russian army was deserting everywhere, and they were all wanted to get home. And for a while, it seemed like an age, but I don't think it was more than two or three hours, uh, we traveled on the roof of a train, a mother lying sort of spread eagle over us and clinging. Well, I was so petrified, I don't really remember what happened. I know I was terrified. I didn't take more than two hours, and then they gradually dragged us into the train. Um, that there were a lot of groups of soldiers. Um, I was told there were deserters. That uh, you could see in various corners of squares, etc., uh, with somebody in the middle haranguing the crowd. Mainly, as far as I can remember, on the the wickedness of war and uh, the necessity for the war to stop. And that appeared almost overnight, that sort of phenomenon. Um, and I remember people saying, with a rather contemptuous air, yeah, well, these merely deserters, all these people. By July, Lenin thought the time might be ripe for an uprising against the provisional government. The other left-wing parties disagreed. The Bolsheviks first backed a demonstration by 20,000 armed sailors, then realized it would end in failure and tried to stop it. However, in the official Soviet version of events, as dramatized by Eisenstein, the provisional government is shown violently suppressing a spontaneous demonstration. Eisenstein's version shot with three perfectly positioned cameras, has often been used by later documentary makers. On July 4th, over half a million workers and soldiers went out into the streets in a spontaneous demonstration of protest. However, the provisional government cruelly suppressed the peaceful demonstration. Striving to prevent further bloodshed, Bolsheviks appealed to the demonstrators to return to their homes. The provisional government, in its attempts to aid the bourgeoisie to rule by absolute power, stepped on the road of armed suppression of the revolution. At this point, Kerensky's authority was threatened less by the Bolsheviks than by the failure of the Russian summer offensive and by the disintegration of central government authority. Late in August, the commander-in-chief, General Kornilov, a man, it was said, with the heart of a lion and the brains of a sheep, 
attempted to restore order by a military coup. But the commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Russia, General Kornilov, had started a revolt. The goal of the Kornilov revolt, and no one had any doubts about it now, was to prepare for the restoration of the monarchy and disperse the Soviets. During these critical days, the bourgeoisie appointed General Kornilov as an executioner of the revolution. He did not lose time and decided to strike at the heart of the revolution. He decided to occupy Petrograd. Bolsheviks called on the workers, soldiers and sailors to come to the rescue of the revolutionary capital. Eisenstein's October shows Kornilov's so-called wild division being won over by the wise words of dedicated Bolsheviks. In fact, all socialist parties joined in resisting Kornilov's attempted coup. Kornilov's few supporters had been among the middle and upper classes. I remember my mother weeping bitter tears over the possibility that uh, Kornilov was not going to be supported by either the government uh, or really even the public opinion. The failure of Kornilov's coup played into the Bolsheviks' hands. In September, they gained majorities on the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets. The president of the Petrograd Soviet was Leon Trotsky. The image of Trotsky's role in East and West is very different. In the Soviet Union, as shown in this censored photograph, he has been robbed out of the picture. But Trotsky was right at the heart of the organization of the October Revolution. Lenin and Trotsky were always pronounced in one word. It was Lenin Trotsky, like that. Uh, and I suppose I imagined at one time that it was one person. Uh, Trotsky was certainly never mentioned without Lenin, and Lenin very rarely without Trotsky. Meanwhile, in Russia, for the Allies, things had taken a turn for the worse. Dissatisfied with the Kerensky regime, the workers listened more and more to the overtures of Lenin and his Bolsheviks. By now, central government had virtually collapsed. Every village, every city, every regiment was a law unto itself. Industry was paralyzed, inflation was out of control, food supplies plummeted, and the German army moved within striking distance of Petrograd. A million or more peasant deserters flooded into the countryside, accelerating the pace of land takeovers. Everything the provisional government did seemed to be a betrayal of the interests of the peasants, workers, and soldiers. Only the Bolsheviks were consistently hostile to the Kerensky government, and only they claimed to have an immediate solution to the problems of the country at home and in the war. So the Bolsheviks began to win more and more support. The provisional government sat isolated in the Winter Palace. Lenin was ready to take power. Meanwhile, Lenin had returned to Russia and took advantage of a situation for which he'd been waiting through all the long and often tedious years of exile. Now, at last, the Marxist prophecy was to be fulfilled. The scene was set. The minor parts were all allotted. The extras had assembled. It only required the leading actor, and here he was. The other claimants, the poor Tsar soon to be butchered along with all his family in a cellar. Kerensky, nearing the end of his brief eminence, would soon vacate the stage. Indomitably, systematically, ruthlessly, Lenin set himself to take over. The Manchester Guardian correspondent recalls a prophetic warning by Kerensky. Then he ended this great peroration, I shall never forget it, that out of the fiery chaos that you are creating, there will arise like a phoenix a dictator. I shall not be the dictator you are trying to create. And he walked back to his seat. And Lenin stood quiet, sat quietly in the corner, stroking his beard. On October the 25th, by the old calendar, Pravda announced that power had passed into the hands of the Soviets. In fact, on that day, the provisional government was still in emergency session in the Tsar's winter palace in Petrograd, while the Tsar himself remained in exile far away in the Urals. Kerensky left for the front, hoping to bring back with him a few faithful regiments. His government took refuge in the Winter Palace, where it placed itself under the protection of young cadets and a woman's battalion. This was the only spot in all Russia over which the government had control. 
Within a few hours, by nightfall on the 25th, the Bolsheviks had seized the main strategic points in Petrograd. All that remained was the Winter Palace, the seat of the provisional government. Cameras at that time couldn't shoot in darkness, so there's no contemporary newsreel or photographs. Eisenstein's film, made 10 years later, is the supreme exponent of the heroic image of October 1917, the taking of power by the masses. Even when Eisenstein's actual footage isn't used, filmmakers have retold the same basic version of events. The Aurora is waiting for the signal. Night has already fallen. At last, at 21 hours, 45 minutes, the Aurora's six-inchers fired a blank salvo at the Winter Palace. The signal for the attack, for the storm. Again, they are slow. 18,000 men in the square and less than 2,000 in the palace. What are they waiting for? They still hope to reach an agreement to avoid bloodshed. And it was far past midnight when they stormed the Winter Palace. Protected by the fleet's guns, the workers in a night attack stormed the Winter Palace of Petrograd. Communists forced open the gates of the Winter Palace, but by that time the government the cadets and the women soldiers had disappeared, leaving a few dead behind. The outcome could not be in doubt. The Kerensky government had lost all along the line. In November 1917, Holy Russia went Bolshevist. In fact, there was no mass storming of the Winter Palace. It was a much less dramatic and more disorganized affair. The American journalist and Bolshevik sympathizer, John Reed, gave this contemporary report of events by a sailor who took part. About 11 o'clock, we broke in the doors and filtered up different stairways, one by one, or in little bunches. When we got to the top of the stairs, the officer cadets took away our guns. Still, our fellows kept coming up, little by little, until we had a majority. Then we turned round, and we took away the cadets' guns. Eisenstein used live ammunition in the making of October, and it's become a standing joke in the Soviet film industry that more people were injured and more damage was done to the palace making the film than during the revolution itself. The Soviet version of the storming of the Winter Palace omits what happened immediately afterwards. Soldiers from all over Petrograd descended on the wine cellars and began what one leading Bolshevik called a wild and unexampled orgy. But it was a time of idealism as well as of drunken celebration. The Bolshevik leaders were inspired by a vision which they were never to fulfill of freeing the Russian people from oppression and exploitation. But the heroic myth of the storming is still official Soviet history. The myth of a revolution made by the masses rather than the reality of a seizure of power by a determined minority is what justifies and underpins the communist regime. Telegraph wires kept humming for days, informing the vast country of the communist victory. The rest of Russia made very little attempt to stem the tide. I was in bed with a slight flu, so I stood up uh, on the bed and saw a rather fat officer with two uh, officer cadets rush out of the manege with a gun, a cannon, turn it round and let it off into the gate, uh, the Trinity Gate, whereupon all the windows opened and my governess rushed in and took me to the dining room which faced the court. So the um, anti-communists were in the manege and were there shooting into the Kremlin and the communists were surprisingly in the Kremlin and were shooting at the manege and we were in the crossfire. Uh, just gradually uh, um, was first riots in the streets but it finished by being a proper uh, battle. Uh, there was no uh, really army in the country so there were just students and uh, 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 
uh, youngsters who were fighting the Bolsheviks. And uh, the battle was terrible, but uh, I lived in the outskirts of uh, Moscow. So we there were spared from the terrible uh, horrors of that uh, battle. And when the battle was over, we heard a very unexpected news that the Bolsheviks were um, winning. And uh, everybody were persuaded that uh, they will last only a few uh, months. They decided they'd bury things, you know, because the revolution was going to last a fortnight. Everybody said so, you know, next fortnight, next fortnight, it'll be all right. And an uncle of mine kept on running around and saying, it's a fact, it's a fact, it won't last. Yes, it was quite unexpected to everybody. And we didn't know all these leaders who appeared later, like Lenin and uh, the, uh, Trotsky and the rest of them. After the surrender, I went out with my governors into the Manege Square and had a little walk around. And it, my impression was that something had gone very wrong. First of all, instead of um, elegant uh, women in uh, cars and carriages, the square was absolutely full of rough-looking ha characters in ships in pits uh, that one sees in the country, but uh, not in central Moscow. And they seem to be walking about for no good reason, merely feeling that uh, probably the city belonged to them and uh, there they were. And then one or two houses were smoking ruins. And that I found very shattering as a child to see how destroyed and still sm smoking. They burst in and my dog was running around. He was a little bulldog, French bulldog, and they shot him in the back. And um, so, of course, I screamed and yelled and prostrated myself over the dog trying to protect him, but somebody did shoot him again, so he was out of his misery, but I was in an awful state over it. And uh, so my father was very angry. He said, why did you shoot the dog? They said, well, it's a bourgeois dog, so he deserves death. And that was it. So that's how I found out about the revolution. When the battle was over, I naturally went to the university. And I will never forget the sight I saw in its holes, the rows of the bodies of the students who fell fighting the communists. I uh, went uh, along their rows, looking at their faces. And they were the best sons of Russia. And uh, their faces were fine, very many beautiful faces, the flower of the country. And I was uh, grieving struck by looking at them. And I uh, bade farewell to them on behalf of their mothers, their sisters, and their fiancés. It took the British press some time to grasp the importance of what had happened. They certainly didn't treat it like one of the most important political events of the century. British cinema audiences were none the wiser. The official wartime newsreel didn't mention the October Revolution. Instead, it showed a film about the King and Queen visiting Whip's Cross Hospital. In Russia, though, people knew something momentous had happened. It was quite unlike the aftermath of the February Revolution. This time, things were being changed, and fast. Whether for better or worse, depended on where you stood. But this was the beginning, not the end of the story. The worst was to come. They began on a wave of joy. They issued the promised decrees. All classes of society and all titles are abolished, and there is established the general denomination of citizen of the Russian Republic. The right of private property in land is abolished forever. All land is taken away without compensation and becomes the property of the whole people. All ranks in the army, beginning with the rank of corporal and ending with the rank of general, are abolished. The army consists of free and equal citizens bearing the honorable title of soldiers of the revolutionary army. The first Leninist decrees were adopted here on peace, immediately begin talks on a just democratic peace. On land, the landlord's ownership of the land is abolished immediately and without redemption. 
What the Bolshevik workers, soldiers, and peasants had called for became law in the first minutes after the victory of the revolution. Lenin addressed the soldiers and sailors over the radio. Immediately elect your representatives to begin talks on an armistice with the enemy. This right is given to you, comrade soldier. The October Revolution marked the beginning, not the end, of the Bolshevik conquest of power. The myth is that the October Revolution gave the Bolsheviks power. The reality is that they had to fight a bloody civil war to win it afterwards. There was widespread support for the Bolshevik policies of peace, bread and land, but this didn't constitute approval for the one-party state or for the repression and terror which followed the revolution. Just how far the Bolsheviks still were from majority support in Russia as a whole was shown by the elections to the Constituent Assembly in November. The rival socialist revolutionaries gained an absolute majority, while the Bolsheviks won less than a quarter of the votes. When the Assembly opened in January 1918, the Bolsheviks simply broke it up. It took a bitter civil war over the next three years to give the Bolsheviks control of Russia as a whole. The reality of the October Revolution was an armed rising by a revolutionary minority inspired by the political genius of Lenin against a government that had already lost control. Once in power, the Bolsheviks replaced that reality with the propaganda myth of a revolution of all workers, soldiers and peasants under their leadership. One of the most effective vehicles for that myth became the cinema. Today, 70 years after the revolution, the most powerful image of 1917 still remains the heroic myth of Eisenstein's October.